let's get to our guest now. Peter Escho is co-founder of Wealthy and joins us on the line from Sydney. So as we heard in the data check with Brian there, Peter, we've kind of got this uh, struggle in terms of investors looking at what Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan means, but also these hawkish comments that we continue to have from the Fed pushing back against uh, the fact that there is no sign yet of inflation easing. How are you kind of reading all of the price action amidst these? And, and I guess what was your take from those Fed speakers? Thank you, Julia. It's great to speak to you again. I think what we're seeing in markets is uh, we're still trying to look for a direction and we're still trying to digest the impact of the most recent central bank movements. Um, I think what's clear is that there is an easing of economic conditions and the bond market tends to be signaling that. If you have a look at 10-year yields in the United States and where they were a month ago and where they have been this week, they've definitely paired back. And even though overnight uh, we did see a bit of a spike, and I think we'll continue. We'll continue to have a very temperamental market. However, the economic data is starting to show that there's an economic slowdown. Hmm. And for me, I think bond yields have capped. Um, I don't think we'll see mid 3% you know, on the 10 year for a while. And it's all about you know where it settles and where we go next year and, and how deep the contraction will be. Yeah, it's interesting you make that point because yesterday where you are, the Reserve Bank of Australia raised the cash rate target by 50 basis points. That was widely expected, but the RBA also signaled it may slow the pace of rate hikes this year. And there was a similar conversation happening in the States, particularly in the wake of a lot of the weak PMI data that we've had. It seems like the Fed in the States is pushing back against that narrative quite strongly because they're not convinced that a moderation in activity is going to necessarily lead to a reduction in inflation. Do they have it right or do they have it wrong, do you think? I think for the Fed, the, the task is a lot more difficult. Um, so if we just have a, have a look at the Fed, they can't be seen as opening the door to stopping because that defeats the whole purpose. Their primary objective at the moment is to stop the rate of inflation from blowing out. And if there's any hints, if there's any signals to the market that it's working or it might be sooner than expected, it defeats the purpose. Uh, if we come back to Australia and have a look at the RBA's commentary, some, some very interesting insights. First of all, an admission that they expect the inflation rate to come down next year from about you know six, six and a half to about 4%. And secondly, towards the end of the statement, they're basically saying that they haven't uh, pre-committed. They're going to be data dependent and they're going to sit and watch. And I think that's a little bit more honest. Uh, they can afford to say that because they don't have uh, what the Fed has at stake. Uh, but I think it's just a sign that central banks all around the world are going to be very data dependent. They've got their finger on the pulse. If inflation's a problem, they're committed. But they're also very mindful of the slowdown and the impact on growth. And I think that's the truth. That's what mm. the bond market is signaling, even if the Fed doesn't say that. You say in the notes that you've provided to us too, that you see going back to a pre-COVID environment in Australia, and, and we're seeing that in a number of nations. But when it looks, when we look rather to China, a different story is they're continuing with this dynamic zero policy. We saw quite a bad month for Chinese stocks in July. Uh, what's kind of the outlook for the remainder of the year as we also heard authorities kind of abandon that 5.5% growth target? There's a few interesting things um, that I'm watching in China. First of all, the, the Hong Kong data that came out this week um, and the extent of the slowdown and economic growth there, but also shipping costs. Uh, I've been keeping a close eye on shipping costs and shipping costs coming out of China are actually trending down. And so I think what the, the global economy and particularly the developed markets, those that are big trading partners with China uh, are watching is as China comes back, um, you know, as China gets back, what is the impact and how much of the supply chain contractions that we've experienced are actually relaxed a little bit over the next few months. So there's a lot going on there. You know, central bank policy and monetary policy in China is always viewed through a very different prism. Mm. But I'm trying to look for anecdotal evidence and, you know, things on the ground, pricing mechanisms, shipping costs, those things that give us the clues as to what happens next year. Yeah, and the interdependency among economies, clearly. I mean, we saw over the weekend the factory activity reading in China unexpectedly contracted. And within that report, I think the uh, China steel industry PMI was at its lowest reading since 2008. So where you are in Australia, that doesn't bode well for iron ore production, does it? 
No, it's our largest export. It's our largest wealth. Um, you know, our fiscal situation is impacted by revenues that come from iron ore mining. And even though we have a very balanced economy, it still is a very large component of our of our exports um, in dollar terms. So the the thing I'll caution about on iron ore and steel production is that they are very cyclical. Uh, you do have these periods where the, the numbers can change. And that's because the process um, is, is very different to maybe other types of industrial commodities. And so, you know, China is coming back. Uh, things are starting to open. And I think what we'll see coming out of China over the next year is the same thing that we saw in the United States, uh, Europe, Canada and Australia to some extent, in that there's going to be an impact. There's going to be a lot of imbalances until you start getting back to a situation where things are back to normal, where you do have that steady, consistent month on month change. Yeah, I think we're still some time away and you're going to see extreme fluctuations over the next year. Still extreme fluctuations over the next year, but I guess in terms of what you're looking for when things do get, uh, I guess, potentially better and when we look at uh, central banks potentially moving to cut rates then, do you have a call on when that could be? I think, Juliet, the bond market is you know, my number one guide. Um, if you have a look at two-year bond yields in the United States, they are still expecting the Fed to... Uh, continue to hike, you know, the Fed, central banks have their credibility on the line. They can't screw this up. They really, really have to get this inflation down and it's working, but they need yeah. to go through with it. The 10 years are showing that it's going to come at a cost. And I think yeah. 2023 is all about that cost, which companies, mm-hmm. which sectors are going to be hit. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and I think that's where as an investor, you've got to be looking to. All right, Peter, great to chat with you again. Peter Esho is co-founder of Wealthy on the line from Sydney with us here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. 